yeah, so we're going we're gonna to talk about get used to power outages here. So, all right, so get ready for the rolling blackouts. Uh, we're going to be looking at the EPA regulatory onslaught here. So, uh, about me, you already heard everything that was, you know, important, except uh, I also grew up on a dairy farm in rural Wisconsin, which is why I care about uh, issues like energy policy, right? So, way too many people think that milk comes from the store and they think energy comes from the electricity outlet. And one of the things that I like about my job is I get to connect those dots for people because uh, otherwise they take it for granted. So uh, about Center of the American Experiment, we are Minnesota's leading public policy organization. Uh, we obviously do work on energy and environmental issues, but we have people that work on health care, education, uh, public safety, and the economy and taxes. Uh, we're also starting a chapter in North Dakota, so if you're interested in what you see today and want to check out our website, go to AmericanExperimentND.org and you can do that. Uh, our, our energy work has basically become uh, the national leader in pushing back against liberal energy policies, whether that's at a state level, like Minnesota, when they passed a 100% carbon-free electricity mandate, or EPA's regulations. So uh, we've also got a quarterly magazine called Thinking Minnesota. It gets delivered to over 100,000 households. And uh, we aggressively market the materials that we produce. Uh, so we do TV ads, radio ads, um, you know, direct mail, social media campaign stuff. Uh, you've probably seen our video uh, called Support North Dakota Oil and Gas. Uh, half the adult population in North Dakota has seen that. So. Uh, that's just some of the work that we do in order to promote the energy industry, uh, both in Minnesota and in North Dakota. So uh, the EPA regulatory agenda. The Biden EPA is writing or updating several regulations that are going to undermine the reliability of the electric grid. Uh, uh, that's, I'm going to call that CCR, not like the band, even though they've got some bangers. Uh, we've got the mercury and air toxic standards, that's the MATS rule. We're going to be talking about the regulations on CO2 emissions. Um, and then there's also the tailpipe emissions, right? So I'm not going to really get into this, but it is worth noting that EPA is burning the reliability candle at both ends. While they are shutting down the reliable power plants to keep you know, the grid going, they're also increasing the demand for it by forcing two-thirds of the, you know, new car sales to be electric by 2032. Um, so that's going to have implications. So calculating the consequences of EPA's regulations, we've been working very closely with the North Dakota Transmission Authority. So big thanks to John Weida and Claire for, you know, believing in us and having us model the, the cost and the impacts of these regulations. So we did CCR, OTR, and the carbon rules in MISO, and we did the OTR and CCR rules in Southwest Power Pool. So, you know, obviously that's a big deal. Uh, the lignite plants sell into both markets, so that's why they were, they were interested in that. Uh, and these regulations are going to undermine electric reliability in the heartland, and they're coming at the worst possible time. So just taking a quick state of the grid, and when I say the grid, I mean MISO. Um, so America's electric reliability is dwindling and EPA's regulations could finish the job. So this is from the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. Uh, they're responsible for setting and enforcing the reliability standards for the United States and Canada. Last summer, two thirds of the country was at risk of rolling blackouts if we had elevated demand for electricity. Uh, and the reason that we're at an elevated risk is because too many coal plants have shut down and we haven't replaced them with reliable generation. And then we also have areas on the map here that were not uh, blacked out, or sorry, that were not expected to be at an elevated risk that had blackouts last winter, right? So the southeast, you had North Carolina, South Carolina, parts of Alabama, Mississippi, um, yes, and uh, Louisiana. Uh, or Tennessee, rather, sorry, uh, they all had blackouts during Christmas because the natural gas infrastructure that was supposed to help keep the lights on froze up, right? So that, they call it Winter Storm Elliot. But we have now, we're going to be, you know, getting rid of the coal plants that actually showed up to work during these periods of time. 
uh, at the worst possible time. So MISO is uh, in the black this year, allegedly. We have a capacity surplus of 1,500 megawatts, but moving forward, we could be at a 2,100 megawatt capacity deficit by 24, 25, the planning year. So that's basically like the next couple of years. And then moving forward, we could be short as much as nine and a half gigawatts of capacity. And that is solely because we are gonna be shutting down thermal plants. Uh, there's a few nuclear plants that could be going down. There's gonna be some natural gas retirements, but the biggest thing is gonna be the retirement of coal-fired power plants. Uh, just as a result of utilities trying to get depreciated assets off their books so they can build more stuff and make more money. Uh, must be a great business model. Uh, good if you can get it. But, um, and lastly here, the North American, the NERC, uh, the, the agency I talked about earlier, this year identified energy policy as the number one threat to grid reliability. And that's because you've got states like mine, where I live currently, Minnesota, uh, enacting 100% carbon-free electricity mandates without increasing, or sorry, lifting the moratorium on building new nuclear power plants. So uh, Minnesota is committed to doing the dumbest thing possible in the dumbest way possible. Um, and then you have EPA regulations that are going to be compounding all of these problems. And the problem with the EPA regulations, in my opinion, is you know if Minnesota wants to do something that doesn't comport with physics and reality and they want to suffer the consequences, that's one thing. But EPA is effectively going to be forcing all the rest of us to participate in that experiment. So um, calculating the cost of the carbon dioxide regulations. So uh, just kind of getting into this, you guys are all familiar with this plant. Uh, EPA issued uh, proposed rules in May of 2023 to re reduce emissions from new and existing coal and natural gas fired power plants. Uh, essentially what the rule is doing is saying that coal plants have to install carbon capture and sequestration equipment on their plant by 2030 or agree to shut down by 2040, right? So if you have a coal plant and you wanna operate it past 2040, you need CCS. And for natural gas plants, uh, you either need to start using CCS or burn quote unquote green hydrogen that does not exist uh, in order to you know, keep your gas plant going. There's a third option for gas, which is you run the plant less frequently and then you kind of make room on the grid for more wind and solar, which I suspect is what's gonna happen. Uh, so these rules have been described as the biggest and most consequential set of rules to regulate new and existing coal fire power plants by the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. Uh, and I think that's right. So uh, basically what we did is we modeled the impact of these rules on reliability, resource adequacy, and cost. And we determined that these, these uh, rules as currently written and as envisioned by EPA, they're gonna cause big blackouts. So um, meeting EPA's emissions targets without having those blackouts is gonna be hugely expensive. Uh, it's gonna increase the cost of compliance with the regulations by $246 billion in MISO alone. Uh, and that means that's a $7.7 .7 billion compliance cost for MISO. And that's more than EPA expects the benefits to be for the entire country. So we really think that uh, you know, our modeling is gonna be used in order to get an injunction or maybe you know, some court wins uh, on this, this regulation because uh, we are the only uh, outfit in the country that modeled the reliability impacts of this, uh, this EPA regulation. So um, basically, uh, this is what EPA thinks the MISO grid is gonna look like over the next couple of decades, right? This is straight from every time EPA publishes a regulation, they have to, you know, basically provide a wonky document called a um, regulatory impact analysis or a RIA. And this says, uh, basically, it outlines all the assumptions that EPA is making to justify their rule. It's, it's wonky. You don't need to get too into it. But this is what they think is going to happen. They think that the coal fleet about 50 megawatts in MISO as of 2021, is gonna get almost entirely shut down by 2035. And we're gonna build a lot of wind, solar, and battery storage to hopefully replace it. So how many of you guys are familiar with the concept of resource adequacy? Yeah, a handful, right? So uh, think of it as pole vaulting, right? So believe it or not, like just by looking at me, I was a below average pole vaulter in high school. Um, but essentially what we're trying to do here is we want to clear this bar, 
right? So that black bar, the solid bar, is our maximum electricity needs for the entire year. It's our peak load. And that dotted line is our uh, reserve margin. So that's the margin of safety. And when you do a resource adequacy analysis, essentially what we're doing is we're creating a stack. So we're saying, okay, look, we've got 38 gigawatts of coal in this example, 52 gigawatts of natural gas, seven of hydro, 20 of nuclear, and that's helping us clear that initial bar, right? And in this scenario, we're, we're a smart grid operator and we're not relying on wind and solar to help meet our reserve margin because maybe they don't show up when you need them most, right? So when I talk about resource adequacy, basically we're pole vaulting. We're trying to get over that bar. Uh, so EPA modeled the, the resource adequacy of the rules, but not the reliability. And then they also did some sleight of hand. Uh, so what EPA did was they assumed that 99% of the changes that would happen to the electric grid uh, over the next three decades would be the result of the Inflation Reduction Act subsidies uh, and only 1% was going to be due to their regulation. So what they ended up doing is they said, okay, well, we're going to evaluate the impact of this last 1% on whether we have enough reliable power plants to meet our peak demand, but they didn't look at the, the impact of their, their post-IRA base case, right? So all of those analysis, or the 99% the change in the, the fleet moving forward, they didn't look at the reliability impacts or resource adequacy impacts of that base case, right? So it's a BS baseline. And I just want to read this because it's, this is how they said it in their technical support document. The focus of this analysis is on comparing the illustrative proposal or proposed rule scenario from the RIA to a base case that is assumed to be adequate and reliable. So EPA did the regulatory equivalent of making sure that you had the structural integrity on the top floor of a 100-story building without doing the same thing for the preceding 99 floors, right? So basically, they say, top floor looks great, preceding 99 floors, hope it's legit. And uh, it, <laughs> surprise, surprise, it is not legit. So um, just, to, just to talk a little bit about how the resource adequacy process works. So every single type of power plant gets a different accreditation or a capacity value uh, based on how reliable that plant is, right? So that makes sense because um, MISO says, you know, during the summertime when we have our peak electricity demand, the wind isn't generally very productive. So we're going to give it 18% out of 100 for value in terms of reliability. Solar tends to be uh, available when the demand is highest because it's a hot summer day. So we're going to give that a 50. Uh, but thermal resources like coal, natural gas, nuclear, they get a 90% accreditation because they're the most reliable sources that you're going to have on the grid. Uh, so that means if you're going to try and replace one gigawatt of you know, reliable coal-fired power plants with wind or solar, you need to build at least two gigawatts of solar to replace it, or 5.6. And even then, you're not going to have an actual replacement. It's just on paper because... Uh, you know, North Dakota, you guys have a lot of home heating that's electric, and you're going to have your peak electricity demand in the wintertime when the sun isn't going to be valuable. So EPA is basing the, their rules on a whole bunch of faulty assumptions, and I'm just kind of going through that right now. So the low, uh, the low capacity value of uh, solar and wind, like I talked about, a few slides ago. That's why you have these huge numbers, right? So the grid goes from 204 gigawatts of installed capacity to 457. And what's going to happen in this next slide, you're going to see this huge amount of installed capacity shrink down. And the reason it's going to shrink down is because it's going to take that reliability value into consideration, right? So we went from 457 gigawatts of installed capacity down to about 218 because wind and solar don't often show up to work when you need them. And EPA is trying to compensate for that by just building enough wind and solar to provide enough electricity to the grid, even when those things are not operating very efficiently. The problem here, remember when we did that initial resource adequacy exercise, we had enough reliable power plants to meet our reserve margin, so coal, nuclear, natural gas. That's not the case with EPA's plan. So these are the EPA's own assumptions, but they're saying that by 
2035, they're going to need wind, solar, or battery storage to be showing up to work in order to keep the lights on and just meet our peak demand. And that com continues throughout this model run. And that means if the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow, we're going to have rolling blackouts. So um, we're, I'm just going to talk a little bit about this. It's not super, it's, it's wonky, so I don't need to, to belabor the point. But EPA thinks that the wind and the solar are even more reliable than MISO does. They say, okay, well, we think existing wind is going to be at 19%. We think existing solar is going to be available 55% when we need it most. And there's uh, lower accreditations for newer resources. But ultimately, let's just take the 19%, right? There's 28,000 megawatts, so 28 Cold Creek stations, essentially, of wind on the MISO system. And at times this last summer, that capacity, uh, so during our peak demand day in July, I think it was July 1st there, uh, the wind was only producing 6% uh, of its potential output, so a third of what EPA is assuming. So this is just like this summer. If we have situations like this in the future when we're even more dependent on wind and solar, then it's going to be bad news bears. So essentially what we did, we said, okay, EPA and MISO are believing too much in the reliability of wind and solar. Let's provide a more realistic guess for what they can, you know, be considered reliable. So when we did that, we said, you know, so our wind is probably about 6% reliable. We're, we're willing to go there. And solar is about 12% reliable. So when we look at that, um, that graph I showed you earlier using our estimates for how reliable wind and solar are instead of EPAs, it kind of shows what I was talking about, right? So we do not have enough you know, capacity or reliable electricity in order to meet our, our projected peak load in four out of like the seven years we're looking at, and we never meet our reserve margin uh, because EPA is making really bad decisions and it's gonna affect all of us. So uh, what we did to assess reliability, and this is the thing that nobody else in the country did, we said, okay, we have the grid that EPA thinks is going to exist for MISO in the future. What if we took all of that installed capacity and said, okay, well, what if wind performs like it did in 2019, 20, 21, and 22, and the same with solar? So uh, there's, a, there's a fancy term uh, in the uh, electricity industry called capacity factor. You're probably mostly familiar with it, but if you're not, it's the percentage of output that an asset is producing at any given time. Right? So if you're talking about hourly, maybe the wind is going gangbusters and a wind turbine is producing 80% of its rated capacity, but sometimes it's going to be zero. And the same thing with solar, right? So we just said, okay, we're going to take these hourly fluctuations in wind and, or wind and solar capacity factors and compare that to the real-time demand that we've already seen on the electric grid. And let's just see if EPA's, you know, the, the grid that they envision for the future can keep up with electricity demand and they can't, right? So uh, this purple area on the third hump, that's the battery storage. So basically, uh, there's not enough wind, solar, natural gas in order to keep the, the grid going uh, during this time. So what we end up doing is we start, we burn through all of our battery storage on the first hump, and the wind and solar is so low during this period. This is a 2020 um, weather comparison, right? So in the year 2020, there was an 80-hour wind drought in MISO where all of the wind turbines in the 15-state region were producing less than 10% of their potential output, and for 42 straight hours, they were producing less than 1.5% of their potential output, right? This wasn't a polar vortex where the wind turbine shut off at negative 22. It was just another day at the office, and if we have a situation like that in the future with EPA's proposed MISO grid, we're talking massive blackouts. And that happens again in 2021. These are the biggest blackouts that we saw in our analysis. Uh, so at one point, 20% of all of the electricity demand in MISO would not be able to be met because wind and solar were performing so poorly in 2021 compared to the electricity demand, right? So 20%, 26 gigawatts of capacity. So, you know, 24, 25 coal creeks, um, basically, uh, gone, wiped off, right? You can think about it that way. And 26 gigawatts is enough to power the entire states of North Dakota, Minnesota, and Wisconsin at the exact same time. So 
Uh, and this is also happening in January, right? So it is the worst possible time to have a blackout in the upper Midwest. So um, these, are, these are like the real consequences of what we're, we're looking at here. And the thing that we did in order to get a cost of EPA's proposal is we said, look, no judge in America should be okay with massive rolling blackouts. So the, um, the plan that EPA has put forward should not be a rational basis for evaluating the actual cost or reliability impacts of the rules. So what if we were to meet EPA's emissions reductions targets without the blackouts? Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, so in order to do that, you need to add a lot more wind, solar, battery storage, and a little bit more natural gas. And so you end up uh, adding about 150 gigawatts of new capacity, and that's very expensive. So yeah, um, so you have the 603, that's what you would actually need to keep the lights on, and the 457 is what EPA thinks they need in order to keep the lights on. That's a big discrepancy, and it's gonna be costly to meet that. So um, it's gonna cost an extra $246 billion. Uh, so most of that is uh, additional capital costs, right? So you have to way overbuild your grid with wind, solar, and battery storage. So sometimes the wind won't be blowing much at all, so you need to have every single turbine spinning. But if there's times when the wind is blowing pretty well, you're gonna have too much power and you need to shut those wind turbines off or curtail them and basically waste that capacity. But it doesn't matter to the rate payer because they have to pay for that wind turbine whether it's spinning or it isn't spinning. That's just the way that it works. Um, so the $118 billion is capital costs, $103 billion is utility profits, right? So this is the main reason why you see utilities announcing that they're gonna go carbon free uh, all over the country because they don't operate in a free market. There's no free market for electricity. They're all, or not all, but the investor-owned utilities are generally government-approved monopoly utilities. And the price of electricity is actually set by a state public utilities commission. I, I know this is kind of getting, just bear with me for a second. So the price of electricity is governed by a formula and the formula is called the cost of service formula. And there's no math here, but basically it says the utility can charge enough for its electricity to recover the cost of building a new asset plus a 10% return or a 10% profit on their equity whenever they build something new and that gets approved by the Public Utilities Commission, right? And there's the other side of that equation is every year that an asset depreciates a little bit, they earn less profit on that asset. So that's why you see Excel Energy closing down a perfectly good coal plant that's been in operation for 20 or 30 years because they're not making a profit on it anymore. They want to build as much wind, solar, and battery storage as possible because that earns them a bigger return. It's the upside down, it's the opposite of every other, uh, every other business, right? So utility profits are a huge reason why we see this you know, kind of rush to 100% carbon free in utility resource planning. Uh, and then you have higher fixed costs, you have more property taxes because there's a lot more property to tax. And then you've also got uh, additional transmission costs. So uh, now I'm gonna get into the uh, ozone transport rules and the coal combustion and residual rules. This'll, this'll be a lot quicker. Um, so, uh, as much as 17 gigawatts of uh, capacity, coal capacity, could come offline in MISO as a result of the ozone transport rule. And then another you know, 12 and a half gigawatts of capacity could come off as a result of the coal combustion and residual rule, right? So we're looking at a lot of capacity. Basically, all of that 50 uh, gigawatts that we were looking at earlier is going to be wiped out. There will be about 20 left. Um, so this is what you would need to actually replace those and not have blackouts. Kind of that same thing that we looked at earlier uh, with those two charts with the 457 and the 603 next to it. So you'd be retiring just a little bit of coal and a little bit of gas and you'd have to build a lot of wind, solar and battery storage to try and make up for that. And the reason we made this assumption instead of natural gas is because that's currently what uh, the MISO interconnection queue looks like. It's almost entirely wind, solar, and battery storage projects, and there's about six gigawatts of natural gas. So this is what the future looks like, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and complying with those regulations together in MISO would be an additional 650 uh, gigawatts, 651, sorry, billion dollars, not gigawatts, 
uh, through 2035, right? So if it's not the um, ozone transport rule and the coal combustion residual rule or the EPA regulations on CO2, like they're basically going to try and get at the coal fleet no matter what. And they're basically layering on straws to the camel's back and hoping that this is the one that breaks it. Uh, so there's the same risk for a capacity shortfall or a blackout in this o or the OTR and CCR scenario because you're still going to be relying on wind, solar, and battery storage to meet your, you know, to clear your hurdle or your clear your, your pole vaulting bar for your peak demand and your reserve margin. And it's the same thing for the uh, Southwest Power Pool. I don't want to feel like Southwest Power Pool didn't get any love today. Uh, it's essentially the same thing. You're going to shut down uh, the coal-fired power plants. You're going to build a bunch of whole, or a whole bunch of wind, solar, and battery storage, and then uh, it's going to cost the ratepayer billions of dollars in the end because you're going to be spending a lot of money on assets that aren't overly productive instead of you know putting capital into uh, plants that could run for another 40, 50 years if you took care of them right because you're worried about the regulatory implications of what EPA is going to do down the road. So. Uh, same thing, even bigger risk of capacity shortfall in Southwest Power Pool uh, based on the, um, like the, the percentage of coal that would be at risk as a result of the ozone transport rule and the coal combustion and residual rule. So uh, with that, I'm open for questions, comments, and scathing rebuttal. Um, if you have any questions that you want to email me, go ahead and do that. Uh, or this is my office line, so I'm happy to take any questions that you guys might have. In your study today, uh, you did mention that battery storage was going to be assumed at 100%, but earlier today, we, we, the California issue, the batteries weren't even available when they needed them during their rolling brownouts. Did you think that you need to reevaluate it? Obviously, it's going to help your cause, not, not hinder it. Yeah, so uh, we used EPA's assumptions for that, right? So EPA is the one that thinks it's going to be available for 100%, and MISO has some similar assumptions for that in terms of um, they think like, okay, well, if you've got a two-hour battery, we think it'll be, you know, 100% during the peak demand hour because, you know, it's a summer peaking system and there's going to be some solar. Honestly, I don't think anybody really knows how to properly give a capacity value to storage. And I'd be interested in learning more and talking to the guy from California to see what they're experiencing just because, you know, this is, this is what my colleague Mitch and I try to think about all the time. It's like, okay, what's the capacity value of a battery when you have enough reliable power plants to recharge that battery for the periods in time when you need it most? Like, okay, well, maybe that's, that's 100, right? Like, if you've got a battery next to a nuclear plant and you've got, like, a variation in your, uh, your electricity demand, maybe you just run that nuclear plant steady eddy and you take the, you know, if you have an excess of electricity, you use that to charge the battery. And then, you know, when you have those fluctuations, maybe that battery deserves a 100% rating. But what does a battery deserve when you have it being charged by completely intermittent generation? Can you give it any capacity value? And these are the questions that everyone is grappling with. And uh, we're, we're coming across it, honestly, we don't know the right answer either. But, you know, MISO is trying to figure this out. Uh, and SPP is trying to figure this out. But unfortunately, I think that there's a lot of uh, pressure on those entities to give them a high rating because a lot of these utilities that are, you know, big members pay a lot of money to be included in MISO. They want it to have a higher accreditation so they can bid into capacity markets. So, I mean, that's a great point. I, I wish I had a better answer, but I, nobody does. I just right. got a question over here. Um, cool. You know, not only... Does the uh, law of physics tell us that uh, EPA scenario or the EPA scenario isn't going to work? I think the other thing that has to be factored into the impracticality of it is just pure public acceptance. Yep. Um, you know a guy named Robert Bryce. He maintains something called the Renewable Rejection Database. Yeah. There is no way in the world that the public is going to accept this kind of a blight on the landscape from wind and solar. Yeah, absolutely. I love Robert. He's a he's a good buddy of mine. So. Um, yeah, there's been an increasing rejection of wind and solar projects and transmission projects 
throughout the United States. And EPA just assumes that their transmission is going to get built essentially overnight. There were no constrictions on that. So we're not, we're not agreeing with EPA's assumptions. We're basically saying if you are going to be making these assumptions, they should at least make sense on the back end, and they don't, right? So we're just trying to say these are your, this is what you think is going to work, and it isn't. So we felt that was the best way to protect our analysis from being considered cherry picking or anything like that. We just said, look, your own stuff doesn't work. Um, we have an R here. Cool. So dovetailing on that a little bit, um, I just recently read something last week where the uh, influx of renewables is being grossly overstated because of the amount of local uh, commissions and planning and zoning committees that are um, putting moratoriums in place to the tune of like 1,800 wind projects or 1,800 uh, planning and zoning commissions have done moratoriums on wind and 800 on solar. Are you including those types of things in your analysis? Uh, no, I mean, we could, right? But EPA isn't. EPA is assuming that they're going to have this kind of uh, carte blanche to do whatever they want with the future of the electric grid. And especially when it comes to the carbon rule, we wanted to stay as true to their assumptions as possible to make sure that our, our you know, the CYA of, you know, that, that we weren't going to cherry pick anything. So you're absolutely right. Like, all of, all models are wrong. Some models are useful, right? So, um, we think that EPA's models are not very useful, and the, one of the reasons that they're wrong is for that exact reason. You guys are like, we can make it to lunch on time if we don't ask any more questions. Here. You might have mentioned it earlier, but what communication do organizations like yours have directly with the EPA? What kind of input are you providing them to try to guide them in a different direction? Yeah, absolutely. So we filed this. There was a public comment period, which is basically where EPA says, tell us everything you think about this rule. And we filed comments saying all of this stuff. There's like a 28 or 35 page document on our website that we submitted to the agency. We basically said, Here's, we think this assumption, this assumption, and this assumption are incorrect. Here's what happens even if you use your own assumptions and just kind of try to hindcast the reliability based on weather conditions that we've already seen. So uh, will EPA take that into consideration when they're drafting the final rule? Maybe. Uh, we'll figure that out next year when they publish it. I wouldn't hold my breath. Um, we tried to get uh, more information from EPA on some of the um, assumptions that they were using on that. We basically wanted them to help explain what they were, uh, what their thought process was for some of it. And we never heard back from them. And things that I've heard from other folks in, you know, more of the industry side of the, the perspective here is that EPA's Office of Air and Radiation has not been responsive to them either. So a lot of the people who are running the plants that are, you know, keeping us all in clover are kind of being boxed out too. And that's just what I've heard. All right, anyone else? Cool, see you at lunch. <laughs> <laughs>